Greetings, environmentalists, and we're here today to learn about the next series of important issues in environmental science, and that is weather and natural disasters. So today we'll be looking at thunderstorms, lightning, and hail, and extreme weather patterns. So let's look at your learning objectives and connect those to what we're here to see and learn about today. We'll be discussing the different layers of the atmosphere and how they correlate to extreme weather. And then we'll look at an in-depth review of prevailing winds. Because prevailing winds are kind of what drive weather patterns around the globe, as well as ocean circulation of currents. Then we'll take a look at what extreme weather is and learn about thunderstorms. And then we'll look at the origins of hailstones. Those are like really cool things. And then we'll explain what causes lightning and how it works. So let's start with the atmosphere and get right to business. The atmosphere is notorious for organizing itself into specific layers. Just kind of like the inside of the earth does um, when we take a look at how geology formed the earth, the atmosphere works much the same way. So without incoming solar radiation, the temperature of the atmosphere would simply decline steadily with altitude, but that's not what happens. We see some fluctuations, and those fluctuations are caused by the gases that are present within our atmosphere, and certain concentrations of specific gases can change those elements. When we get towards the end of the semester, we'll be looking at climate change and put that uh, and link it to what we're learning about today. About half of the incoming solar radiation is absorbed by the ocean because it's a very dark surface. There's lots of it around on the Earth, so it takes in a lot of that sun. And then land surfaces also absorb the heat. Some reflect it as an FYI. About half of the incoming solar radiation is absorbed by the dark ocean surface that covers the Earth and then even certain land surfaces that are dark. And that's called the Earth's albedo. We'll be kind of linking that to our very last lectures of the semester. In turn, these ocean and land surfaces heat the troposphere and radiates the energy outward. So some of our uh, heat is absorbed, some of it's reflected, and that has to do with the color of the Earth's surface. So the darker the color of the albedo of the Earth, albedo referring to color, the more it absorbs heat. And the lighter the color is, the more it reflects. So some of that heat gets caught up in these areas right in here, and specifically the troposphere and the stratosphere is really two important areas that we'll be focusing on today. So let's start with the very, very top layer and kind of work our way down to what touches us. The exosphere is the layer way up here at the top, and it's actually the very top layer of the Earth's atmosphere before you touch space. And this is where we put our satellites to orbit. So they're out of any, uh, kind of blocking in terms of visual of the Earth. So if there's clouds present, they're going to be lower down in the atmosphere. So that's one of the reasons we put the satellites up there, because we're not just monitoring what happens on Earth. We're also monitoring things in outer space. The thermosphere, and it gets its name thermo by heat, this is actually the smallest mass of the atmosphere. But what I mean by mass is weight, but it is the thickest in terms of dimension. So when you look at from the 80 kilometer mark from the surface of the Earth up to 320 kilometers, you can see that that's a heck of a lot of distance from the bottom to the top of the thermosphere. This is where we put space shuttles when shuttles are actually in operation, and that's where they orbit the Earth. Now the mesosphere, meso means middle, by the way, mesosphere rests on top of the stratosphere and reaches about 80 to 85 kilometer above the Earth's surface. So this is important because this stops meteors and meteorites from striking the Earth. And so really most of the time if you get uh, some kind of uh, thing coming in from outer space that's rocky material, ice material, something that we consider meteors, they are burned up and you can see what would be called a falling star. So really, most of the material that makes a falling star, which is just a meteor material, is microscopic in size and tiny little fragments. On a rare occasion, it may make it through the mesosphere and actually strike the Earth. And that's how we can find meteorites on the surface of the Earth. 
Now the stratosphere is probably one of the most important layers we're going to talk about. So this page in particular, or slide, you really need to take up attention to. The stratosphere extends from about 50 miles, I mean, uh, kilometers, excuse me. The stratosphere extends from about 50 kilometers um, up here down to about 12 kilometers. And this is the area where we actually include the ozone. So this is the good ozone stuff that we want. So ozone is O3, that's just three molecules of oxygen that's put together. And that's highly unstable, by the way, in terms of a chemical compound. Ozone makes life on the surface of the Earth possible because it absorbs ultraviolet radiation. That's why we don't want holes in it. So you might have heard there's bad ozone, there's good ozone, and we'll revisit this in climate change. And that's true because we don't want ozone down here on ground level that we can breathe and that can cause bad things to happen to our health and to absorb heat because we just don't need any more extra help with that dimension than we already have. But we certainly want to protect the ozone layer that we have in the stratosphere. So when people are referring to holes in the atmosphere or in for the ozone layer, they're talking about in the stratosphere. All right, there's a really cute little layer between the stratosphere and the troposphere. And it's this line right here at the 12 kilometer mark. And it's called the tropopause. I mean, seriously, why did somebody have to come up with the name tropopause? But there's a reason for it. It's a cold layer, not a warm layer, that extends and it exists between the stratosphere and the troposphere, preventing water vapor from entering the stratosphere. And you're going, what's the big deal about water vapor? Well, water vapor is actually one of the most important greenhouse gases that people don't talk about because it absorbs a lot of heat. So we don't want anything uh, that's water vaporish coming from the troposphere getting into the stratosphere because that'll warm that stratosphere up in a way that we don't need to have happen. All right, so as we get to the troposphere, this is where all the action happens that you and I can relate to. This is the lowest layer of the atmosphere, which extends uh, from where we just saw at the base of the stratosphere down to the Earth's surface. So we live in this area, and it accounts for 80% of the total mass of the atmosphere. So it's a really important portion of the atmosphere. Weather occurs within this layer, so that becomes the topic of nature today, and it reaches an altitude between 8 and 18 kilometers, depending on where you are on the Earth. Because imagine that you're on the top of a mountain, you're going to have like Mount Everest. You would have a dif different distance uh, to the top of the troposphere than you would if you were at sea level. So, and it also depends on the season. So you put those two things together, and the distance and thickness of the troposphere changes. This is where we have a majority of our greenhouse gases. And so we continually emit greenhouse gases into this atmosphere layer as well. So the atmosphere kind of like has had too much of this thing. So I'd like you to think about maybe Thanksgiving and think about what it's like to have a whole pumpkin pie in one day at Thanksgiving or pumpkin pie, whatever your favorite dessert is. And you think about what that would do to the scale, considering everything that you ate that day. I mean, you have eaten tons of stuff, and then you add in this whole pumpkin pie. We're talking like mega-sized pumpkin pie here, right? So likely the scale, weight scale, would go up for you because you've consumed way more calories than you've burned unless you ran a marathon. Really, right? So what will happen is you overdid it. So assume that's kind of what's happening to the troposphere. However, if we were to only have one slice of pumpkin pie every day for 30 days, a whole month, it probably wouldn't take the same cumulative effect if we were exercising regularly because we'd burn that off. So that's kind of the problem with the poor troposphere. It's gotten an overload that it can't handle and utilize and uptake and burn. So what we end up having is leftovers in the... Uh, a fat excess, if you want to put it that way, in the troposphere. And that's what the greenhouse gases are doing. They're accumulating in excess. Let's talk about extreme weather. I promise when we get back to climate change at the end of the semester, I'll revisit the importance of the troposphere, and I'll use the same analogy that we talked about pumpkin pie. So you might just want to make that note in your book, because it's, a, it's an important detail to link the course content together. All right, what is weather? 
So when you think about the weather and you're watching TV at night and when you get home or first thing in the morning and they're saying, oh, the weather's coming on in 10 minutes, stay tuned. What is that really? It's the state of the atmosphere with respect to wind, temperature, cloudiness, moisture, pressure, and anything related to weather. So the etc. dot, dot, dot. It's the conditions of the atmosphere at any given uh, time and place. So the status of weather changes, and it changes regularly, not just per day, but sometimes even per minute and hour. Often weather of historical significance commonly occurs because of this excessive characteristics. Most extreme weather is determined as extreme because of its cost and damages to humans, both monetary and in, in depths. So as we look at some of these extreme weathers, I patterns and extreme weather events over the next few le lectures, I want you to keep that in mind. Weather can be anything that impacts the atmosphere, including geologic issues like volcanoes, volcanic eruptions. It could be something like a hurricane. It was what you're seeing uh, right here. Hurricane Andrew back in 1992 devastated Florida. Some storms are only considered extreme because of the amount of lives they influence. Others are extreme simply because of the weather phenomena criteria that they meet. An epic storm that never impacts anybody will likely be forgotten by people and only remembered by scientists like me. So hopefully uh, you won't encounter too many severe weather events in your life, but if you do, they can be very life-changing. So what's the problem? In many cases, good weather records do not exist beyond a century in the United States. What I mean is in the last hundred years, we really have good weather data. So this is a weather report, no kidding, an actual weather report from 1793. It does not give us very good scientific measurements. So what we would need to do is collect the data and be collecting the same data over a long stretch of time to determine whether or determine weather patterns, uh, weather trends, things of that nature. So with poor records that we have for weather, sometimes it's rather difficult to determine what the average really is. So if you haven't been taking your weight, uh, your actual body weight over the course of a year, and then at Thanksgiving you pick out on that pumpkin pie, you don't really know what your average weight is. And so you don't know when you step on the scale that you might have gained X, Y, Z amount of weight. So that's why we need good data that's long term, that serves as a baseline. It's kind of like the doctor taking your temperature, your blood pressure, measuring your pulse every time you go in and also making you weigh. I hate that part. But nevertheless, um, they're doing that to establish a baseline because one day you may come in and something's really out of whack. Your blood pressure is just completely different when the baseline is that tells them something's wrong. So if you can't determine the average, you can't determine what an extreme measurement is. So I can't determine if you have some kind of out of whack blood pressure until I have something to compare it to that's a baseline. So records from the early 20th century and before are limited in scientific value because they didn't collect using good instrumentation, they didn't collect consistently, and we really don't have a good baseline data for them. So most permanent weather stations are maintained by NOAA. You learned about them earlier in one of our lectures over environmental agencies. That's the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And they're kind of the weather gurus. Now, satellite imagery has only been available since 1973. So I've been alive as long as satellites have been alive. You're like, oh, wow, you're old. I'm getting there. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, 1973 was a big deal when satellites started orbiting the Earth because that kind of compounded just this regular 24-7 data influx that scientists could use to start helping measure and understand weather patterns. This is Hurricane Ava the first tropical cyclone ever photographed from space, and it gave us a lot of insight into how these storms operated. Until then, we didn't have a visual of what these storms look like from above. So I'm going to use this as a geologic correlation for a minute. You really don't know how big the Grand Canyon is until you've flown over it. And looking at geology from the sky tells you a whole different thing. So looking at the Earth from the sky in terms of atmosphere gives us so much more information. And you and I take that, like 
Uh, we know that because we've seen these pictures of uh, uh, hurricanes and cyclones many, many times on the news. Well, that stuff didn't used to exist before 1973. So uh, this particular one was in the Pacific. And by the way, uh, cyclones are called cyclones in the Pacific, hurricanes in the Atlantic. Those are kind of fun things to know. So we're going to be looking at all of these interesting things as we come up on this entire weather and natural disaster phenomena. So stay tuned. To, we're really going to cover thunderstorms um, and lightning and hail and severe weather today, but we'll be getting into other of these topics throughout the next few lecture series. So let's look at thunderstorms, rainy to severe. Thunderstorms. Now take a look at this wall cloud right here and then see the center of this storm. This is a remarkable storm right here and you can see the rain just gushing out of it. So how does something like this occur and how often does it occur? There are over 100,000 thunderstorms occurring annually in the United States alone. That doesn't count any of the other continents or countries. Only 10,000 of these are considered severe. 16 million occur annually on the planet, and 1,800 are occurring right now somewhere on the world, somewhere on the globe. So thunderstorms are very common. And you're like, well, they're not so common for me. It depends on where you live, and it depends on the season, obviously. On average, a thunderstorm cell only lasts about three hours, and it's because of energy. They've got to pick up energy some way. So that's kind of one of the reasons why a hurricane dissipates as it hits land. It can't absorb that energy. And we'll be looking at that a little later. Storm systems that produce rain longer than three hours are often uh, new cells being born while the older one is simultaneously dying, which is really bad when you start to get new cells to grow while old ones are getting into their mature stage because you can start to get some pretty serious weather that comes out of that. You're looking at some Doppler radar here and you're beginning to see how the colors of the rain over here correlate with how much is being um, developed and winds and so forth. And then the red pockets you could put in with heavy. So if you end up with purple, you've got extreme. So that's important to uh, correlate when you're looking at the news. And you guys know this stuff. I mean, you've seen weather enough on the, on the news. If not, maybe you should start paying attention to look at the news with a new pair of eyes and lens that helps you interpret what you're seeing better. We rarely notice when one cell dies and another is born because their proximity are almost adjacent to each other. All thunderstorms require moisture and rapidly rising air to form. So those are the two basic requirements. Thunderstorms tend to form over land more often than water because the land heats up quickly and to warmer temperatures than water during the day. Water, uh, like oceans, have a really, really good potential to absorb heat. And we'll show you how that almost sounds contradictory when we get to hurricanes because of something called latent heat of condensation. So that term's coming up, but it won't be today. So when we look at thunderstorm types, we'll be looking at cyclonic, or a graphic, and convectional. And um, cyclonic is caused by a front, where you have a weather front, and we'll explain what those are uh, in a little while. But essentially, you get this cold, maybe a cold and a warm front, uh, or a cold and a warm water weather pattern together. And um, what will happen is you start to get rising temperature, actually, and cooling off temperature, which sends this warm air upwards. It's cooling, and it causes water to reach its dew point. So when water reaches its dew point, it's going to do some kind of precipitation or condensation. It rains. So what is dew point? It's essentially the temperature in which water condensates. And every temperature corresponding with a barometric pressure reading has a specific dew point. That's often shown on the news, and you're like, well, what's that dew point really mean? Well, that's what it refers to. So if it's 70 degrees outside and the dew point is 69, if it reaches and dips down to 69 degrees, essentially you should have condensation. So in an orographic situation, we get this kind of picture right here where you get some kind of land mass that actually blocks the cloud from being able to go over. So you get dry, dry air on the other side. So let's apply this to California. You get Los Angeles on one side, and then you get this big mountains that are in that area, and then the air just kind of goes bloop, 
goes to the other side, and you don't usually get the weather on the other side, so it's extremely dry. And this would be Death Valley National Park over here. So when we get convectional uh, currents, what will happen is warm air travels upward, it cools, and it creates rotation. And that rotation begins to create a very devastating type of storm. So let's look at cyclonic thunderstorms first. This is when one air mass replaces another, and it's caused when moving air mass collides with a stable air mass. Bummer for that stable air mass, right? Very distinctive shapes on radar. So look at this frontal system right here. That's a good indication of a front right there. And uh, typically they advance at a steady pace, sometimes called a squall line. So you don't want to be near that squall line because that would be a really great place to form a tornado and have hailstorms. So there's two types of fronts and you're going to need to know both and recognize the symbols for both from this point forward in the course. And I would hope from this point forward in your life so you'll know what you're seeing on a weather map. There are cold fronts and warm fronts. So let's start with the cold front down here. All blue on a weather map, and it has triangles pointing in the direction of the flow of the cold air. So it's always blue with uh, little triangles coming down towards the point of where it's going. All right, since heat rises, the little half, uh, half moons here are put on the red for warm. Uh, fronts and they point the direction that the hot air is rising. Okay, so when you get two of them mixed together or where they smash together creating a cyclonic thunderstorm, then you're going to have this kind of weather pattern right here. This is a recipe for disaster, complete recipe. So the leading portion of a cold atmospheric air mass moving against eventually replacing a warm air, ma warm air mass can cause cyclonic thunderstorms to occur, just like this. So the leading portion of a warm atmospheric air mass moving against eventually replacing a cold air mass can do the same thing. In either case, you're going to end up with a thunderstorm. All right, what's orographic thunderstorms? Well, I mentioned Death Valley. So Death Valley, let's use that as a case in point. You've got Los Angeles over here, and there's a big mountain range on the other side, or in between Los Angeles and Death Valley National Park. And they actually sit at the same elevation. If you want to be honest, oops, sorry. Well, let's talk about orographic thunderstorms. These are called when air is forced upward because of an increase in terrestrial altitude, such as a mountain. Orographic referring to some kind of orogeny, and an orogeny is a mountain building event. So typically there are mountains, there's some kind of barrier, natural barrier here. So what will happen is you'll get a rain shadow effect where it rains because as the air moves up in altitude, it cools to its dew point and it rains here. Rarely does that air mass that's wet make it to the other side. So that's why it's called its rain shadow. You have rain on the side that where it's the moisture source is coming from, and then the other side virtually never gets it. When in reality, Death Valley sits about um, below sea level, parts of it does, the national park. And uh, then you've got Los Angeles that sits at sea level. So um, when you compare the two, it should seem like Death Valley really shouldn't be having um, the remarkably different weather than, uh, than we see in Los Angeles, but it does. And it's because of rain shadow effect. So when you have this, this can cause monsoons in some places of the world, and it can cause some seriously difficult challenges for ecosystems, linking back to the beginning of our course. So what are convectional thunderstorms? You're seeing a video of it to your right. They're referred to as supercells and they happen as this cumulus cloud forms and then matures into a cumulus nimbus is exactly what you're seeing here. And then it's going to dissipate itself out when it rains. But all convectional thunderstorms are created by the convection of rapid rise and fall of air masses and they're referred to as supercells. So let's watch that one more time. This is your cumulus cloud stage and then it's getting an anvil at the top. So it's mushrooming out and you're getting convection here and notice the rain is happening. When the rain begins to really come out of that cloud, you're gonna dissipate out its energy. But don't underestimate the importance of this maturing stage that you'll have because it can be very dangerous. All right, so when you get some kind of convectional 
thing, a convectional system occurring, you get white puppy clouds like you see to the left. The puppy clouds indicate rapid expansion and growth of moisture, and it begins with the warm plume of rising air. The rise draws surrounding moisture, and the warmer air, the higher it travels before cooling off. So if you've got really, really warm air, hint, hint, towards climate change, kind of linking those two things together, then you're going to have um, the clouds can get bigger and taller. And so your anvil can become stronger. So the higher the clouds, the more severe the storm should, storm should be. So we actually measure a cloud in like a thunderstorm, its height, because its height gives us an indication of how severe the weather will be. Once it matures into a cumulus nimbus cloud, and cumulus nimbus means bad news, okay? It provides the heaviest rains during the stage the cloud is simultaneously drawing and releasing moisture, meaning that it's in a very angry mode. This process of rising and falling air coexisting in the same body of air is why we call it convectionary, because convection means you're just moving and circulating that air mass through that system. Now the third stage is it dissipates out itself and it rains. And um, so here's your uh, cold line right here. We'll get to that in a minute. But clouds cease drawing moisture into its structure and releases all the remaining uh, moisture that it contains and rains itself out. So that's why clouds don't last forever because they'll usually rain themselves out. Sometimes we don't see that down here at the Earth's surface because the rain actually happens way high up in the atmosphere. The remaining parts of the cloud break apart at high altitudes. All right, so one last glimpse. You get the cumulus stage, you get the mature stage where you get a lot of convection happening, and then it's reached its anvil stage. And finally, we hit this mark right in here, and then energy releases itself out in the form of raining itself out completely. All right, let's talk about hail. Everybody loves to talk about hail. What is hail? and understand that this is like one of the neatest phenomena of weather out there. Hail is precipitation in the form of solid ice. You're like, well, duh, Elaine, I already know that. What you may not know is what it looks like inside, and that's what's kind of cool of how these things form. It can be extremely dangerous because of the size and the speed at which the ice falls, and I can testify to that from having been in a storm that had hail balls the size of oranges and softballs. It, it demolished my car. It actually totaled it. And I was um, a resident assistant at Baylor University at the time on the fifth floor of Collins Dormitory Residence Hall. And I broke windows all over campus, and we saw all these gorgeous cars just getting demolished, and people were out there doing their normal daily afternoon runs, and people got injured. Um, luckily, most could take cover and just have slight injuries, but some people were pretty seriously injured that day. So when you see this, how does this thing really form? While the air is still rising and falling in the thunderstorm, the central portion of the convectionary system traps a po pocket of water droplets, and then it's going to prevent them from falling. And so what happens is it's a convection system the air rotates like this. And the more that the ball has to go around and around and around like this, the more it's going to create layers. So a hail ball is actually a series of layers of ice that's formed as it's been traveling through uh, one of these supercells. So let's kind of show you what that looks like. So as we're drafting up, can you see the balls right in here doing their thing? And they're as they go up, they're going to get another layer of ice because they're reaching high enough in the atmosphere that they're drawing some of that moisture. So the bigger the ball, the hail ball, the more it's been in the convection system, the stronger the supercell was. So when you're looking at something like uh, baseball size and softball size type hail balls, that's a pretty significant amount of time that it's been rotating. So it's like an onion. If you cut these things in half, you can actually see the layers. So this is... Uh, important to understanding how and why we can create hail balls and it's locating the freeze line. Where is that in a cloud? Because the freeze line is going to allow for the hail balls to actually uh, crystallize into ice. So that's where it's going to be is right in there. And so if the hail balls that you saw in that demo a minute ago actually start rising above that area and start swirling around up here, they're just going to get layer after layer after layer of like an onion of ice. So when you look at the freeze line, 
um, where would you expect that one to be in this picture? You would expect it to be probably somewhere right in here. And that would be uh, where the freeze line would exist. So the higher the anvil cloud extends above the freeze line, the greater the potential for hail to form and also the larger the size potential for hail to form. Hail formation increases as warmer air rises, but it takes longer to cool down and the trapped moisture requires additional time to condensate. So the hail balls just simply get layered one after the other, one layer on top of the other as it travels and circulates through that uh, anvil cloud. And it requires additional time to condensate into precipitation. So finally, when that anvil cloud loses its energy, instead of rain, it may drop out its hail balls, or both. <laughs> and it's pretty uh, amazing. So when a storm stops drawing air for, during dissipation, it begins to drop its hailstones because the buoyant air is no longer in place to keep the ha hail elevated in the clouds. So it has to drop it. Often the sky looks very green, and that's a good indicator, green, I guarantee you, that's a test question, before the hailstorm because the light is refracted through the ice infested clouds and it resonates out a green color. So when you hear somebody say clouds are going green, they're referring to we're going to get a hailstorm. This is an actual hail ball that, uh, that has been cut in half. So every time a hailstone circulates below the freeze line, it's forced back up into the anvil again and gains another layer of ice. And the hailstorms look like onions whenever they are cut in half, and this is exactly what they look like. So here's a baseball over here, and then here is a baseball-sized piece of hail. So how do we classify hail? Pea-sized hail, and that's talking like the vegetable pea here, is one-fourth inch in diameter. Mothball size is half inch in diameter. Dime size is three-fourths inch in diameter. Nickel size is seven-eighth inches in diameter. A quarter is one inch in diameter. A golf ball is 1.25 to 1.75 inches in diameter, and a baseball is 2.5 to 3 inches in diameter. A softball is 4.5 inches in, in diameter, and you can have it even bigger than softball size. So... Let's get to science surveys on this. About 24 people per year are injured by hail, though rarely are there fatalities. It could happen if you had a hail ball that was just ginormous in size. These right here would be pretty bad if you got hit in the head by one of them. The larger the hail, the stronger the thunderstorm, and the last hail-related uh, fatality occurred in Texas. Imagine that. In 2000. And... Um, not a good year. That was the same kind of storm that hit the Waco area when I was at Baylor. And um, and that was actually important because it was not on that campus, obviously, but the same storm system hit the Dallas-Fort Worth area pretty hard, too. The largest hailstorm currently recorded in circumference is 18.75 five inches. Can you imagine? That's this one over here. And it fell in Aora, Nebraska. Not a surprise because they have lots of thunderstorms, lots of tornadoes. And um, so be wary when you're traveling and especially in the Midwest and you see a green cloud. Maybe you need to go find shelter. The heaviest documented hailstone weighed 1.65 pounds. So what's lightning? We're going to take a look at lightning. It's a remarkable thing. Lightning is a spark of static electricity that's caused by colliding water molecules inside of clouds. And thunderstorms intensify this process by quickly turning uh, moisture or molecules of moisture in the sky. So as that occurs, you're going to get a reaction, and that's what this is right here. So the atmosphere is full of positively and negatively charged uh, particles called ions. Test question for sure. And as friction creates ion as water molecules lose electrons, when the ionic charges become too great, they spark and create lightning. So you can get lightning in lots of different directions, not just downward. You can get it side to side, cloud to cloud, cloud to land, so forth. And so um, you don't want to get in the way of lightning. Before a visible lightning strike, positive and negative energy, if you'll watch the animation here, 
uh, surges and you can only see part of the connecting process but that's why lightning sometimes appears to flicker is because the positive and the negative energy surges and so it looks like a flash and looks like a flicker and as you look at the blue and the red so the negative and the positive uh, the blue is the negative the red is the positive and as they come together they're going to create that surge of energy and that's what creates a lightning all right, what are the primary types of lightning? Zigzag, I love zigzag. Makes an odd shaped pattern traveling to the ground and it's what most people would think of as the flash. Ribbon looks like multiple strikes following the same path. And forked begins as one bolt but touches the ground in several different places. That is extremely dangerous type of lightning. Spider, cloud to cloud, bolt starts from one cloud to another. This is beautiful thunderstorms but extremely dangerous. But I think probably the coolest one just personally for me is zigzag because I just think it looks really neat. All right, so hail and lightning locations, where would you expect to find them? So the average strikes per year, as you start to look at the continents, uh, certain areas have more thunderstorms and lightning and hail than others. And it kind of makes sense. So let's look at our continent and look at these areas and guess what? No wonder the Midwest had the biggest hail ball ever recorded. And then you start to look at Central America. This is Tornado Alley right in here for the United States. And it's not a surprise. And that's where we're going to see the hail and lightning locations be the strongest. All right. A couple more science servings. What's astrophobia? It's the irritational fear of lightning. And there are some people who are extremely scared of lightning. You may be one of those. That's a perfectly normal response. And if you have astrophobia, um, you may want to stay indoors during a particular thunderstorm that creates lightning. Fulminology is the scientific study of lightning, and lightning is about one inch wide. Looks a lot bigger than that, doesn't it? It is between 15,000 to 60,000 60, degrees Fahrenheit, and it moves at about 60,000 miles per second, which is roughly one third the speed of light. In other words, you can't outrun lightning. Power fa failures caused by lightning strikes cause $1 billion in annual damages. And there are about 100 lightning strikes each second. So these are pretty common things to have happen. Let's get to the science servings of lightning. So lightning kills an average of 62 people annually. And of those people killed, no judgment here on how it's done. Let's just kind of look at the statistics. 98% are outside. Now, I think that's an obvious to you, which means you should try to find a place indoors. Let me caution you, never go into a cave during a lightning storm because it can bounce off the walls, and if you're caught in the middle, you'll get struck. There is a group of Boy Scouts that were killed that way. You can Google that uh, and look into that situation. 89% are male, 30% are between 20 to 25, 25% are under a tree, kind of the same concept as the cave, 25% were near water, once you're struck, you're likely to be struck again. And if you live 80 years, the odds of being struck are 1 in 10,000. So this dude over here to the right, Mr. Rory Sullivan, holds the world record, Guinness Book of World Records, for being struck the most time by lightning seven times. Now this guy did not go around with a lightning rod on his head or his hat. He just got completely unlucky. This is about the unluckiest lightning guy ever to live. So hopefully you will not beat uh, Roy Sullivan's record for being struck by lightning, but that's kind of an interesting fact, isn't it? Photographing lightning. If you want to photograph lightning, set your camera to leave its shutter open for 30 seconds or longer. And uh, that's actually good to know because lots of people like to photograph lightning because it's so beautiful. One National Geographic camera photographs lightning at 6,000 shots per second or frames per second to capture all of the scenic things that are happening because now that you know that lightning strikes can move so fast and how they form, you'll understand why you would need to take so many frames per second. What's dirty lightning? This occurs inside a volcanic plume or smoke from an intense forest fire. So let's say you have a volcanic ash and you start to see lightning strikes. Well, that can ha happen or you see uh, some kind of forest fire. Let's say California has their infamous uh, chaparral forest fires out there and it may look like these colors right in here. 
What causes that? It's electrical charges that are generated when rock fragments such as ash, ice particles collide and produce static charges. Inside a volcanic plume, this happens regularly. Just as ice particles collide in regular thunderstorms, the end result is that dirt or dust particulate matter acts as a charging and it makes it a little different color. Are we the only place that has lightning and thunderstorms? The answer is absolutely not. Lightning on Titan, which is Saturn's moon, uh, this is a concept image right here of what it looks like, but this is the Cassini uh, space probe on the surface of Titan has trouble hearing sound waves of thunder because of the different elements in the atmosphere. Their, uh, their atmosphere is made of something different than, than Earth, but they have thunderstorms. Lightning on Saturn in the summer of 2011, a thunderstorm on Saturn stretched over 10,600 miles. This one right up here. And uh, this storm produced 10 flashes per second, and each bolt was thought to be 10,000 ti 10, times stronger than any experienced on Earth. Do not think I would have wanted to be in that area when that happened. So when you take a closer look at that thunderstorm, that's pretty darn impressive. And you start to realize that thunderstorms are not just on our planet. These are phenomena experienced anywhere where you have some type of atmosphere. So as we think about our concluding moments for the day, uh, this would be kind of like our thunderbolts that's go in all different directions. It gets sisters. So as you leave the day, I want you to contemplate and holding on to the image of green clouds and anvil clouds. When you see them, I want you to go, hmm, maybe I need to take notice of that and get to safety. And when the weather man or woman comes on and says, you really have this much time to get to safety, take heed to that. I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye.